hello and welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. You join me in uh, an electric car going to an electric car charging station to talk about uptime. And uh, what is uptime? Well, that's actually what I want to ask you. What is uptime? <laughs> so I'll, I'll explain what's going on, but essentially with you know, new NEVI funding coming in for corridor charging sites and some others, uh, there's this new 97% requirement that a charger is up. And that's great because it shows that, you know, the government is noticing that there's a huge reliability issue when it comes to DC fast charging, particularly away from the Tesla supercharger network. And they're trying to mandate um, that these charging stations are up and reliable and, and good to go for people who are driving. And there's a lot that goes into uptime and it actually, um, is is like totally open to interpretation at least up until recently where now there is more of a definition of uptime at least for one area but states will be able to make their own determinations there's going to be a lot of chargers that are going in that aren't uh, nevi funded that don't necessarily have to uh, fit in with this 97 percent uptime requirement so in this video what i want to ask you guys is what is uptime because ultimately the regulations, in my opinion, uh, should directly reflect what the EV driver base is looking for when you get to a charging station. So I'll share some of my thoughts. I guess I'll share what I think uptime should be. Um, and then, you know, this is one of those videos I never ask you guys to comment. I really never do. Uh, but in this video, I want to see your comments. I want you to log into YouTube. Let me know what uh, you think you, your version of uptime should be. Um, I'm going to be in the comment section, reading them, interacting, as well as, you know, if you find another person's definition of uptime being to your satisfaction, where you agree, like that comment, comment on that comment, try and push it to the top of the YouTube page. Ultimately, I wanna be able to send this videos to lawmakers, policymakers, lobbyists, charging companies, charge point operators, and show them what EV drivers want, what you guys want, what we want to see when we get to a charging station. So that's what we're talking about in this video. So you join me in the Tesla Model S pulling into the Loveland, Colorado Supercharger and you can see really busy parking lot today. There must be some sort of convention going on. Um, but you know, I just have to show the Tesla, uh, by the way, I haven't driven my Model S in a while. Uh, we actually had it on track and some components broke uh, just from the extra stresses of driving around and I haven't even asked to what broke drew kind of handled that whole thing but now it's back and working and i'm driving it it's got a round wheel and it's great and so i'm really enjoying it but i have the car preconditioning to the fast charger it actually just cut off preconditioning because if you look ahead we're pulling into the version 2 supercharger here and essentially i'm going to demonstrate on the first try without much concern what ev drivers want regardless of which car they're driving so we're going to pick a random stall to back into i don't know we'll just do this one right here so actually we'll go one this one there because I don't want to park next to that dude if we don't have to. So hard left, we'll back in here. And basically what we're gonna do is um, get out of the car real time. So we're at the spot, plug it in, and we're gonna be charging at the expected rate. To me, that's uptime, but there's a lot more that goes into it. So let's pop out and let's do it. So we are at the supercharger, grab the handle, click the button, port automatically opens, and we're in and I'm just going to walk away that's all you really need to do you can see the blue light is flashing for communication just give it a couple seconds and it will go green once it goes green it means that the contactors have clicked the negotiation has started and we are good to go version 2 supercharging does take a little bit longer but that's still pretty fast we are officially charging let's pop in the car because it's windy and let's take a look at the speeds we're getting 133 kilowatts 142 right there 148 and I would say that is the maximum that this supercharger can give us. And I know that because we are at a 150 kilowatt max supercharger. So why, <laughs> why can't everything have this experience? Well, I recently attended the Charin uh, conference, which is, a, it was called the Volts conference. And essentially this is a 
a group that is responsible for handling vehicle interoperability and even some more of these uh, topics when it comes to discussing charger reliability and uptime. The point of this particular conference, which I'll have a whole video on coming soon actually, is um, all about plugging in a car and making sure it works, specifically for CCS. Um, Charin is really pushing the ISO 15118 standard. We're currently at dash two, dash 20 will come into the future. And um, what's cool about this Tesla, actually one of the reasons I love having a Tesla in the garage is I can charge this car in the supercharger with you know CCS1 or even with Chatamo. This car can be plugged into literally anything, which is wonderful. So um, what is uptime? Let's get to that definition here. Well, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to uptime and holding charging network operators accountable. The first high level decision that I think needs to be made is, do you consider a charging site as up or do you con consider it on a charging port basis? So if you're gonna essentially, you know, we've seen both Tesla and Electrify America and others actually argue that it should be at the site level. And that means that, you know, if half or more of the charging ports at a location are working, then that site is considered online and good. And, um, you know, for certain areas, I actually could see the argument. I could see that, um, you know, where you're, if you're trying to consider uptime as, can you get a charge at that particular station? Then the answer would be yes. But, but I actually agree with what some of the NEVI funding is going with, which is they've pretty much decided it's going to be on a per port basis. And I think this is the better way to ensure driver confidence, which is you roll up to a charger and if half of them are down, you don't have to move your car. It's gonna be based on when you plug into that port, there's a 97% chance minimum that it's going to be working. Now, 97% is still like what, 10 and something days per year that the charging site or that charging port can be offline, which is still pretty unacceptable. But again, these are minimum requirements. And I think really there's there's the one thing is in this industry, especially after being at the Charin conference and meeting with everyone and seeing all the players and, and all this stuff, everyone wants this to work as great as possible. We're having huge electric vehicle adoption with honestly pretty poor infrastructure uh, hardware that we're able to put in the ground. And it's hard to make it all work from a back end software and the speed is what's making some of this pretty difficult. So what I wanna do is, um, you know, after we clarify the per site or per port basis, curious to hear your thoughts, if you can sort of lead with that in your comments. Um, let me tell you what the actual looking like Nevi definition of uptime will be. So here I have pulled up, by the way, this is like the first time I've ever used a web browser in a Tesla before. So good excuse to do that. Uh, I've pulled up the uh, the Nevi infrastructure, well, Nevi standards and requirements. Uh, this is the final rule, but again, it, it is up to the states to implement all this. And I'm gonna skip through all this, but I encourage you actually read this stuff. And I'm gonna skip to the section that I think will be most interesting to all of you, which is gonna be this one right here, 680-116. And um, essentially this is going through what they are forcing these st states to go through. So the first is the communication of price. We've been to some charging stations recently. We are at APS in Arizona. It was an Electrify America charging station or Electrify commercial that was sold to APS. Because I was a Pass Plus member, I genuinely could not find anywhere the price that would tell me what I was gonna be paying when I plugged in. So here it says it's mandated that it tells you what you're gonna be paying per dollar per kilowatt hour. And so that's really great. And it's going to be displayed and communicated via the charging network. I assume either uh, on an app or on the charging station screen, it must be the real time price. Love to see that. The price structure, you know, this is all going through. And then here we go. Basically, it says minimum uptime requirements. States or other direct recipients must ensure that each charging port has an average annual uptime greater than 97%. A charging port is considered up when its hardware and software are both online and available for use or in use. And the charging port successfully dispenses electricity in accordance with the requirements for the minimum power level. And these are some changes that happened with Nevi. Originally, it was how do you quantify up as in can the port 
you know, is the port working? And it was actually at the expected level was the previous wording, but it's hard to ensure expected level. We're gonna have a lot of new EV drivers. We're gonna have um, cars that may have issues that might be cold, that might be hot and derating for one reason or another. So essentially this is saying that the charging port must be able to output 150 kilowatts. Now that's a bit difficult because it, I think they need a little bit more uh, to go in depth on that particular one because of course if you have a, a car with a 300 volt pack and you only have a 350 amp output, you're, you're going to be a little bit below that. So these things are things that need to, uh, I think, have a little bit more precision to them. But hopefully, you know, you guys can comment and the, they will start coming. So uh, the charging port uptime must be calculated on a monthly basis for the previous 12 months and the charging port uptime percentage must be calculated using the following equation. So this is uptime, according to Nevi, this calculation right here. And it basically shows that you're taking the number of minutes minus the excluded time plus outage, or minus outage, divided by that particular time, times 100. And here you have what it actually means port uptime percentage, total minutes of outage in previous year, and excluded is what they can actually get away with for not counting against uptime. And so essentially when you have, uh, you know, total minutes of outage in previous year caused by the following reasons outside of the charging station operator's control, provided that the charging station operator can demonstrate that the charging port would otherwise be operational. Now, I'm not sure what procedure they would go through for this, but um, for example, electric utility service interruptions, and that would be an excuse against having a charger online. Now, if you really wanted to go, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, maybe some dirty power, ripple power, things that could happen that could bring a charging station offline. We could have you know, the frequency of the grid could drop below a certain threshold where the charging uh, station may no longer operate. And my opinion on this is we should build some resiliency at the charging site itself to at least limit that factor. Um, it's not part of the requirements, but that's, to me, would make a lot of sense to have a battery or some sort of filter on site to make sure that everything is running properly. So electric utility service interruptions is one. Um, basically failure to charge or meet the EV charging customer's expectation for power delivery due to the fault of the vehicle. So if the vehicle, um, even fault, let's say, you know, you pull up to 150 kilowatt charging station, but you're at 90% state of charge in a bolt. Like you're getting 20 kilowatts if you're lucky. So, uh, you know, the, that makes a lot of sense. You, the, you need to have the port, assuming a car can pull that power, go through. But with electric cars, it of course is always based off of pack voltage and current of what the charger can deliver at that voltage. And I wish they would calculate that off of amps and volts rather than actual kilowatt power, because um, we really need to make sure that you're getting the current that most vehicles on the road today require. So, okay, that's the other one. Scheduled maintenance. Now this one is a little bit interesting because I don't know how we're gonna see the CPOs get around the scheduled maintenance perspective. If they go, oh, there's a site down, let's schedule it tomorrow for maintenance. I hope these things, you know, there's some more rules regarding this because you don't wanna see them skirting uptime requirements or things like this. Uh, vandalism or natural disasters. That is one that absolutely should qualify. Uh, vandalism is on the rise of charging stations, whether it's graffiti or even cutting cables or damaging the stations in some malicious way. And honestly, there's nothing charge point operators can do about that that I can see would fix it. That's just something we're gonna have to live with. And um, for example, I've seen charge point, they own and operate some sites here in Colorado actually. And um, there's one in Denver that they hire full-time 24 hour security at because someone kept cutting the cables at that station. So pretty crazy. And um, also excluded are hours outside of the identified hours of operation at the charging station. Now, you could argue, should a station even get funding if it's not accessible 24 hours a day? Maybe, maybe not. But at least if it's, if you show up there knowing it's gonna be closed and it doesn't work, that can't count as, as against uptime. So here's some other things here. Third-party data sharing. States or other direct recipients ensure that the following data fields are made available. 
free of charge to third-party software developers via application programming interface. So that would be like us, Rate Your Charge, could actually get all of this data. So unique charging station name, the address, the location, the charging station operator name, the provider name, the charging station status, whether it's operational, under construction, planned, or decommissioned, charging station access information, such as public or limited to commercial vehicles, uh, charging station day and time availability, charge port infra information, number of charging ports, unique port identifier, which is really important. That way we can calculate it off by everything. The charging uh, connector types, for example, DC fast charging, AC level two, uh, and the connector types really would be CCS or I don't even know if Chatamo is a part of this, to be honest. I don't think it is. So, yep, that's interesting that they put that in there. Uh, power delivery rating in kilowatts by port. And that leaves a lot of room for variability. Calculating charging power off of kilowatts, I mean, we could say, you know, most of these charging stations are rated up to, you know, a thousand volts as an example. So if we do 150 kilowatts, I'll just do 150,000 watts divided by a thousand volts, then we could be left with a port that can only deliver a hundred amps. But in theory, it could do a hundred and well 150 amps but in theory it could do 150 kilowatts at a thousand volts at a 400 volt car like what we're driving now this would only be 60 kilowatts which is less than half the port requirement this is why i don't like them rating things in kilowatts because it leaves these types of confusion for people and i really like that this is all um in here of course payment structure payment real-time pricing all of these other things the problem I see is it's all self-reporting. So you're gonna have to rely on the charging network operators to self-report, self-certify, and self-file a lot of this stuff. That's also why we started Rate Your Charge. Honestly, your um, Twitter submissions, your form submissions, I'll leave the link to the Google form if you don't wanna use Twitter, um, have been incredible. They've been, um, you know, I would say almost industry changing up to this moment. So many companies are following Rate Your Charge, even just talking to a lot of them is you're finding issues out in the field that they never found in testing. You're finding, you know, weird uh, stuff. For example, if you chop a cable off a charging station, most charging stations don't know that that cable's missing until, you know, it can't get plugged into anything. So it wouldn't show a fault. So I think there's a lot of things that need to happen. I'm gonna make a video on those, but some of the most important would be better um, self, I would say, error reporting from the charging station itself. Tell us exactly what's going wrong. We need a standardized fault code, like OBD. If you have an issue with a car, you can plug in an OBD reader, it pulls up a fault for general basic things. We need more of that for charging stations. We need to know when cables are attached or detached. We need to know if the spots are iced, even without someone being in that, uh, plugged into that charger. And that would mean maybe you have a, a camera system with an AI or you have pressure plates or something. Um, and, and, and I'll make a whole video going through more, but these are the type of conversations that we are actually getting involved in now. A lot of our videos I'm learning are being played at Nevi meetings. And uh, what I want to do is have you guys comment. I'm going to make a video that I'll post here on YouTube, but that I'll specifically share to, um, you know, people that are planning sites, uh, charging locations, Nevi uh, sites throughout their states. And ultimately we want to help drive the future of this country's charging network. So let me know in the comments as detailed as you possibly can. I'll be reading throughout the day today. And um, what is uptime? That's what we want to hear from you. This is purely a guide for Nevi requirements, of course, but I think there needs to be a lot more that goes in here. I'm not loving the self-reporting features, but again, I'm seeing barriers to defining a lot of these things. And is 97% enough? Again, that's the minimum floor, um, but really every driver, in my opinion, should have the same experience that we demonstrated in this video, which is I can choose any charging port at this particular charger with a high level of confidence that I can plug it in. I'm gonna charge at the expected charging rate, all of which we had today with zero care in the world. The most amazing thing to me was I was charging in California last week in Pasadena. I was plugging in a Kia electric Nero. I plugged in, I was fiddling with payment. I was fiddling with getting the charging station to work. It didn't actually work. I had to move the car. And then I watched a guy back into the supercharger across from where I was, plug in his Model 3, not even pay attention and just walk away. 
And I almost was like, dude, you wanna make sure your car's charging? And then I remembered, ah, Tesla's got it figured out. Why can't everyone else? And that's what we're hoping for. So thanks so much for watching. Can't wait to see your comments. See you on another one soon. Bye-bye.